you would open with me your Bibles, please, to uh, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 12. I'm going to do just a, a brief five minutes or so of review to catch us all up to speed uh, to where we're at uh, today in the book of Daniel, uh, and then we'll, we'll teach uh, from there. Um, you remember uh, in the four great visions and revelations of Daniel, uh, that in Daniel chapter 2 and 7, uh, that Daniel is given basically the same revelation uh, in, in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 gives us more clarity as well as more information. Um, but in that, we basically see this revelation that is given uh, by God to Daniel about the, uh, the empires of the world, the world empires that would exist from the time of Daniel who was in Babylonian captivity at that time until the second coming of Christ. He's, he's getting this panoramic view of world history, if you will, that would take place until the second coming of Christ. And we learn in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7 repetitiously when it is that Jesus Christ returns. And you remember when it is that Jesus Christ returns. It's in the time of the final kingdom in its final form, under its final ruler, in after the final three and a half years of great tribulation and persecution and war against the saints, that immediately after that time, that Christ comes back. The Ancient of Days comes, right? Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. The Ancient of Days comes. There is judgment that takes place. There's reward that takes place. And we enter into the kingdom of God three times in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 18. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 22. Daniel chapter 7 verse 27. Every single time it says that the, that the saints were given the kingdom of God to that effect. That the kingdom of God was given to the saints. And so we know Christ will come at that time. Then when you get to the, the revelation that he had in Daniel chapter 9, now you have a panoramic view of Israel's history. The 490 years, Daniel's 70 weeks that are cut out of time for Israel and for Jerusalem. And the things that are going to take place within that 490 years, within those 70 weeks. And it began from the decree of King Artaxerxes to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Uh, in the, uh, the month of Nisan, 444 B.C. And from that moment, the decree, be, uh, the, the decree, that's when that 70 weeks begins to start. And there's that panoramic view. And by the end of that 70th week, six things are going to be true. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Things that include transgression will be finished. Sin will be brought to an end. Everlasting righteousness will uh, be established and all vision and prophecy will be fulfilled. Obviously, those are things that have to do with the second coming of Christ and the establishment of His kingdom on earth. Then you get to Daniel chapter 12 and Daniel chapter 12 is another panoramic view that Daniel receives of the very end, of that last sliver of time that last three and a half years, that last uh, half of Daniel's 70th week is what Daniel is going to see here as well as some things that occur after the second coming of Christ, such as the resurrections, such as judgment, such as rewards being given. We know that those are things that occur after the second coming of Christ and entering into the kingdom period. So let's go into Daniel chapter 12. Uh, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of great trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now remember we said this last week, who else said something just like this? Jesus, right? In Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, and then there will be great tribulation, such as... Uh, such as the world has never known since the beginning of the world, even until this time, no nor ever shall be. It's the worst time that shall ever be on planet Earth. 
He says, and at that time your people shall be delivered. So whenever this great tribulation is, there would be a deliverance of Israel at that time. Everyone who is found written in the book. So in other words, those who are being delivered in Israel or you know, during this time of persecution and intense tribulation are going to be people that are found written in the Lamb's book of life. They are the elect Israel. He goes on, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So now we're talking about resurrection, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So obviously these are things that all have to do with the very end, right? When, when you're talking about resurrection unto death, resurrection unto eternal life, when you're talking about uh, uh, condemnation and contempt and shame and judgment, in other words, when you're talking about rewards, people shining like the stars uh, forever and ever, uh, when you're talking about these types of things, as well as the Great Tribulation, you're talking about things that have to do with the very end. There, there's no speculation about that. So he comes here to verse 4. And it, it, let me uh, say this as well. We're going to get into verses 1 through 3 more when we get into the book of Revelation, okay? Because there's uh, great parallels between the two. So we will look at these resurrections uh, more clearly at a later time. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. What, what again is the time of the end? Right, Daniel's 70th week is the time of the end, right? It's the last, last week, week of years, the last seven years of human history as we know it. And that's divided up into two uh, three and a half year installments. We get that from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and we're going to see it here in Daniel chapter 12 as well, as well as Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13. Um, but he wants them to shut up the book and seal the book until the time of the end. So when he's telling him to, to shut it up and seal it until the time of the end, until this 70th week, until this great tribulation time. Uh, he's telling him this, that all this revelation I've given you about all the empires of the world and the course of human history leading up to the very end, this final three and a half years, uh, and after which Christ will come back, destroy the Antichrist, destroy the kingdoms of this world, and establish His kingdom. I want you to take this, this revelation, I want you to seal it. I want you to preserve it, in other words, until the very end. In other words, the understanding of the revelation of these things will become more clear the closer you get to the end. Can, can you imagine being Daniel living in the 6th century B.C. and trying to understand this stuff? Can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine reading this, you know, uh, you, you you, you read this at some point in time in history, you know, and uh, after Daniel has recorded this and you're reading this, you would be, I mean, people still scratch their heads reading this stuff, right? It, it, it's so bizarre, it's so different. But what he is saying is that at the time of the end, these things will be made clear. And that's why he goes on to say, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, a lot has been said about those words. That many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall increase. And they'll point, for example, to all the advances that we have in the modern day. In travel, knowledge, you know, sciences. All, I mean, think about all the technology we have today. Uh, think about the fact that you don't have to send a letter or halfway around the world anymore. You can send an email electronic mail and it will get there in seconds. You can talk to someone around the world face to face uh, over the internet using Skype or any of these messaging services. You can talk to someone around the world. I mean, amazing stuff. But what he is actually talking about in context is the fact that knowledge of these things that are in Daniel's revelation is going to become apparent. Knowledge of it shall increase. 
How many of those that when things get bad, when things get dark, when hard times come, what do people do? What, what did people do last year, for example, 2020, even up until now? They search for answers, right? They, they look for answers. They look for meaning. They look for purpose. They look for what's going on in the world. And so what Daniel is pointing out is that at the time of the end, there's going to be such a desire to know what's going on because it's going to be apparent to everybody that the end of the world is near, that, that this is indeed great tribulation. It's like no other time that's ever existed on the planet of the earth. On planet earth. They're going to be looking for answers. And so their eyes are going to be searching to and fro for knowledge. And God is going to grant knowledge to be given to them. People, I believe, will find the book of Daniel. They'll find the book of Revelation, which corresponds with Daniel. And, and, and insight will be given to them. As it has been given to us, it will be given to them to be, to be able to see what it is that is taking place in the time of the end. So he goes on, he says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? So you have an angel on one side, you have an angel on the other side, you have an angel above the, above the waters of the river, and you have Daniel present. One of the angels on one of the river banks is going to ask the angel above the waters a question. The question he asks him is, how long uh, shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? What wonders? The wonders of the great tribulation, the wonders of this first time that the world has ever known. How long is this going to transpire? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, he swore by God, in other words, the eternal God, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. In other words, for three and a half years. So you have this, uh, this angelic being raising his right hand. That's how you would make an oath in biblical times. It's how we would make an oath today. He raises both hands to heaven and swears by God that it's going to last for three and a half years. How long is this tribulation? How long is this time of difficulty that the world has ever known before? It is going to be three and a half years. And he says, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. You come then to the, the end of the tribulation. Now what I want us to do is, um, you, can, you can hold your place here because we're going to come back in just a moment. And we're going to go over to the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 12. The book of Revelation chapter 12. And, and I want us to think for just a moment, as we go to Revelation chapter 12, I want, I want us to zero in on, on number one, what is happening during these three and a half years? Okay, what is happening during these three and a half years of great tribulation? Well, well we know from Daniel chapter 7, right, uh, verse... Uh, 21, that this little horn, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to make war with the saints and prevail upon them. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 tells us that uh, little horn, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to persecute the saints, it says. And he's going to do so for three and a half years. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 says that. We know Revelation chapter 13 and verse number uh, 5, that he's going to be given authority for 42 months, for three and a half years. <clears throat> and that during that time of authority, the things that he's going to do includes that he's going to make war with the saints, Revelation 13, verse 7. It includes the fact that people are going to be required to worship his image. His image will be animated. 
His, his image will talk, his image will breathe, and his image will strike people down who do not worship it. People will be required to worship the Antichrist. And then we know that uh, the Antichrist during that three and a half year reign is going to require, this is all in Revelation 13, what I mentioned about his image is in verses 14 and 15. And then after that you find out that he's going to require people to take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And without that mark, they will not be able to buy or sell. They will not be able to participate in commerce. These are all things that are happening in this three and a half year period. It is this time that, uh, that, that this Antichrist figure has uh, been given authority to, to, to trample upon the nations of the world. And we see this taking place. And we know, uh, let me ask you again, how does the three and a half years end? You should know the answer to this by now. Christ comes, right? Christ comes, Daniel chapter 7, verse 22, until the Ancient of Days comes, judgment is poured out, and the kingdom of God is established on earth, right? So it ends, That's you find that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, 21, 22, 26, 27. You find it in Daniel 2, 34, 35, and 44 and 45. You find it uh, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 19, 20, and 21. And you find it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. What coming is that? That he's destroying the lawless one. It's the word parousia, which is the word that is used for the second coming of Christ. The full manifestation of the Messiah. The full manifestation of Christ in his messianic reign. When does he destroy this figure? He destroys him at his second coming. Now this is important. Because if you're going to say that there is no future tribulation, if you're going to say that there's no future antichrist, if you're going to say that there's no future apostasy, and all these things are past, whether it be 70 AD or some other time in history, then you would have to believe, necessarily believe, according to Scripture, that Christ has already come. And that we are already in the kingdom, and that the fullness of the kingdom is already here, because the Bible teaches explicitly time and time again, from Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 19, we could go to Zechariah 14, uh, we could go to Matthew 24, 25, we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that explicitly, when Christ comes, He destroys the lawless one. So if you're going to make the argument that these things are past, then you have to believe that Christ has already come. You know what we would call you then? We would call you a heretic because you no longer believe in a future return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we would call you. So, we come back here to uh, the book of Revelation chapter 12. So we, we, we know what's going on during this three and a half years. We know how the three and a half years ends. Now we come to Revelation chapter 12. And in Revelation chapter 12, we're going to see again the, this theme of three and a half years and what is going on during these three and a half years. And when we look at this, I want you to see... Uh, let me say this first of all, okay? Now, we all know the book of Revelation is, is, uh, has the most symbolism of any, any book in the Bible. And Revelation 12 is the most symbolic chapter in the most symbolic book of the Bible, okay? So there's a lot of symbols here. Now, when there's symbols, what have we taught you about symbols before? Remember the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2? Who was the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar, right? Babylon, right? Yeah, in other words, each, each of these uh, symbols pointed to something, something that was neutral. So, so don't get caught up on the symbol of the head of gold or the, uh, the, the chest and arms of silver or the, the belly and thighs of bronze or the legs of iron or the feet of iron and clay. But what it represents, right? What does it point to? What, what's the literal fulfillment of it? And the second thing we, we pointed out to you is this, is that most times... Not every time, but most times, uh, the scripture in the text itself will reveal to you what these symbols are pointing to. 
It'll point you to the reality, to the literal fulfillment of the sign or of the symbol. Most cases. And if it doesn't, then you turn to parallel passages that use the same imagery. And you see what scripture has to say about these, these images. So don't get hung up on the imagery. Get hung up on the literal fulfillment or the reality behind the imagery, okay? And if you did that, you would save yourself a lot of time in studying eschatology, okay? I wish somebody would have taught me that, you know? <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, you ready? Um, so we're going to begin here in verse 1. And uh, this will parallel with, uh, with what we're seeing in Daniel chapter 12 about this time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered and all these things shall be finished. We're going to look at the shattering of the holy people. Okay? Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in the heaven. So, okay, one sign you have a woman and a child. The second sign you have this year, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems and on his head, on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon, so now you have stars that the dragon threw to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, if you, just, if you just look at these first three or four verses, you know, you're going to be scratching your head. Well, who's the woman? Who's the child? Who's this dragon? Who are the stars? So let's do this real quickly before we move on. We'll talk about the woman last. All right. Um, let's, let's look at who the dragon is. Uh, look at verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the who? Devil and who? Satan, right? Devil meaning he's a, um, a slanderer, a false accuser, and Satan meaning he's an adversary. So the, the dragon is the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels. So who were the, the third of the stars that were cast down to the earth in verse 4? Uh, his, the fallen angels that went with, with Lucifer in the fall. These are the, the stars that fell. So the dragon is Satan. The stars are the, the angels that fell with him. And we come back and we talk about this child and the mother in verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. So who's the child? Jesus, right? Obviously, right? It, it's talking about... Uh, first of all, it's capitalized by the, the translators. Uh, you're talking about ruling all nations with a rod of iron. iron. That's Revelation 19, verse 15. Uh, he's caught up to God in his throne. Well, we know again that is Christ. He was caught up, ascended to heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father. So we know that the child is Christ. Let's back up for just a, a, a moment. Oh, let, let's talk about verse 6 now, and then we'll back up. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. How long is 1,260 days? Three and a half years, all right? So we're, we're back to this three and a half years and what's taking place during these three and a half years. What's taking place has something to do with this persecution of this woman who flees into the wilderness to a place that's prepared for her by God to seek protection and shelter from Satan and from the Antichrist. Okay, so who do you suppose that this woman is? And don't, don't, don't give me an answer. Don't give me an answer. Okay. Number one, it's not Mary. Okay. It's not Mary. Uh, number two, it's not the church. Does the church give birth to Jesus? No. Jesus gives birth to the church. Um, so it's some, someone else or something else or some you know, body of people collective. 
And the answer to this is this, okay? Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? The first promise from God concerning Messiah, right? He's speaking to the serpent, Satan. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. You get to Genesis chapter 12, and in order to fulfill this promise, there has to be a line that leads up to the coming of the Messiah, right? For the seed of the woman. And so he chooses a man by the name of Abram, who becomes Abraham, the father of a multitude, the father of many nations. And through Abraham, he chooses that through Isaac, your seed shall be called. And then through Isaac, of course, Jacob. Jacob's name is changed by God to Israel. And through Israel comes the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Israel. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. So now you have Israel. So it's through, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through Israel, through which the Messiah would come. Uh, when we get to, for example, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we read uh, in Matthew's Gospel uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So when he talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, he calls him the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's a descendant of David. He's a descendant of Abraham. He's, 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 he's the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Right, you know, what, we, what we're studying about eschatology all ties right back in to the covenants in the Bible. Not, not theological constructs of covenants that don't exist in the Bible, but covenants that actually exist in the Bible. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant in particular. Um, for example, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, he talks about, um, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He's what? He's of the seed of who? David. Okay? Now, the last one we're going to, I want us to, uh, to look at is this. Romans chapter 9 says it the most profound. Romans chapter 9, the, the first five verses. You're welcome to look at it if you want to. I got to get moving just because I'm down to my last few minutes here, and I can feel my voice uh, going. <laughs> so, Revelation, or excuse me, Romans chapter nine, verses one through five. This this is worth looking at, though, if you do want to follow. Uh, Romans chapter nine, verses one through five. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience, conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. So he's talking about, um, obviously Israel, he's talking about his, 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 his uh, countrymen, those that are according to the flesh. Not according to the spirit, just according to the flesh. Who are Israelites. So it's very clear now he's talking about Israel. To whom pertain, or to whom belong, what belongs to Israel? The adoption, the glory, the covenants. Who, who were all the covenants made to? The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant were all made to who? Israel. Right? We've simply been grafted in or adopted into these covenants. The covenants were given to Israel. The giving of the law, who was that given to? It was given to Israel. It wasn't given to us. It wasn't given to the church. It wasn't given to the Gentiles. It was given to Israel. The service of God and the promises. Now watch this, verse 5. Of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh, who came? Christ. Christ came through who? Israel. Christ came through. Through Israel. I'm going to read it again, verse 5. Of whom are the fathers? Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All right, he's going to talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the next segment. From whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall the eternally blessed God. Amen. So Christ, the child, comes through Israel. 
So, back up now to verse number 4. The latter half of the verse, And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. What, what happened, the time that Christ was born, what did Herod say to do? You all know the Christmas story around here, I know that, right? Kill all the, the male children in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas from ages 2, all the male children from ages 2 down. Kill them all. we, we got to kill this child that was given birth. So throughout history, what you're seeing in Revelation chapter 12 is you're seeing again kind of this panoramic view, if you will, um, of this war of the ages between this enmity between uh, uh, the serpent and the woman, between the devil and, and, and God's people. And you're seeing this, this war of the ages taking place and uh, Throughout the Old Testament, one thing you see is that the devil is trying to destroy Israel. You go to like Exodus chapter 1 and, and you find out that the Pharaoh tells the midwives of Israel, kill all the Hebrew boys, all the Hebrew babies that are being born, kill them all. You see Haman in, in Esther chapter 3, I think that's, that's Persia. Kill all the Jews, kill them all. You, you, you see uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphany, who's talked about in Daniel chapter 11 as well as uh, Daniel chapter 8. Antiochus Epiphany, the Greek king over the Seleucian Empire in Syria from 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. And you see him. What does he do? He launches, that's called the, the, the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Why? Because he's trying to kill every single Jew. In more recent times, right? Taking it out of the biblical text into more rock. What did Hitler try to do? Kill all the Jews, right? There's always been this hatred of Israel. And you have to ask yourself, there is no other ancient people alive today except Israel. Why? They're, that's right. God has a plan for Israel. They, they have been removed from their land. They've been kicked out of their land. The times of the Gentiles has been for nearly 2,600 years. I mean, they've been decimated. They've been persecuted. They've been uh, fraught with danger and hatred. I mean, it's more than just human flesh. It is, it is satanic. It is devilish. It is demonic. To say, I mean, even people in the church have hated Israel. They formulated theology that would be against Israel and, and, and produce hatred. Did you know that the Jew, or excuse me, that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Third Reich, they quoted Martin Luther as the reason why they persecuted and killed the Jews is one of the reasons. Because Luther taught replacement theology and that the church is now Israel and we should kill all the Jews. In fact, one of his last final tracts before his death I had to do with that very specific topic of kill the Christ killers. I mean, it just spills over into everything. This, this hatred, it's devilish, it's demonic, it's satanic. Satan hates the woman. Why does he hate the woman? Because it's through the woman, Israel, that Christ came. So he tries to kill the woman. That was plan A. Plan A fails. So plan B. Christ comes, the end of uh, verse 4, and what happens? Herod tries to kill the child, tries to kill the Messiah. Plan fails. Now you have plan C. What's plan C? Well, plan C is this. We tried to kill Israel before, didn't work out. We tried to kill the Messiah when he came, didn't work out. So we're going to try to kill the woman again. We're going to try to destroy the woman again. Why? Follow me. It was through Israel that Messiah would come. And it's to Israel that Messiah shall return. So he's trying to eradicate Israel, destroy Israel, to avoid the inevitable, what we know to be inevitable, the second coming of Christ. 
So there's this war going on between the two. And I've got to close, okay? Um, I'm going to read verse 6 and then we're going to skip down just for a second, for just for a moment, okay? I, I hate to skip around like this. I didn't want to, but uh, I'm going to have to. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. This is, uh, this is Israel fleeing into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God. When are they fleeing into the wilderness? Read the whole passage and read the whole of verse 6. When are they fleeing into the wilderness? Believing Israel. The 1,000 turns, that three and a half years, right? So this is something that is going on in this three and a half year period where Satan is coming against the woman again, attacking the woman before Christ returns, trying to destroy the woman to try to prevent the second coming of Christ. Now watch this. Skip, skip down for sake of time, verse 12. If you read uh, verses uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, it talks about Michael... The archangel, where did we see Michael again? Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at this time, Michael stood up, right? Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. When did he stand up? Right here, he stood up. And what's he do? He kicks Satan and he kicks all of the, uh, the, the fallen uh, angels, the demons that are with him, kicks them out of heaven. They have no more access to the throne of God. We see that the devil has access to the throne of God in Job, right? The book of Job, Satan appears before the throne of God. We know that he's called the prince of the power of the air. We know that he's called the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Right? Listen, the devil, listen, the devil has never been to hell. Hell is not the devil's. The devil's never been in hell. He hasn't been there yet. He doesn't rule over hell. Hell is not his throne room. That's all Hollywood, okay? Hell is God's hell, not the devil's hell. And God, according to Matthew 25, verse 41, according to Jesus, He prepared the everlasting fire for the devil and his angels. It's God's hell, and God is going to put the devil in hell one day in the future, put him in hell... Secure him there and he'll be tormented day and night forever and ever, the Bible says. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. So he's going to be kicked out of heaven. He's going to be put on earth. And he's only going to be able to be on earth. He's not going to be able to go back up into the heavenlies. He's going to be on earth. Guess how long he's on earth for, folks? Three and a half years. Hallelujah. We're getting this. Okay, you ready? Verse 12. We're going to rush through this. This is how we end every sermon, right? Rushing. It's like sprinting. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Right? I mean, if you're in heaven and the devil's cast down, you're going to rejoice. That's something to be happy about. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. How short of time does he have? Three and a half years. Awesome, he does. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the who? Woman. Who's the woman again? Israel, who gave birth to the male child. But the woman, Israel, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished. For how long? A time, times, and half a time. How long is that? Three and a half years. There we go. From the presence of the who? Serpent. Who's the serpent again? The devil. Satan, right? He's the serpent. And then, uh, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. This is another which is God's providence, God's watchfulness over Israel to protect them in this time. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, with Israel. And he went, believing Israel, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So in other words, he turns from just them. He just wants to wipe out every believer in Christ who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. I don't know about you. I'm one of the believers, right? I want to be known as one who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony 
of Jesus Christ. And for that, we get a nice mark on our back, right? Uh, as, as an enemy of Satan. But it's better to be an enemy of Satan than, than to be an enemy of God. Amen? Because at the end of the day, God wins and Satan loses. So again, we're seeing things that are happening in this 1,260 days, in this three and a half years. Things that occur uh, during the Great Tribulation. This persecution of believing Israel uh, in order to try to prevent the return of Christ to Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, teaching us your word and uh, helping us to see your plan for the ages. It, it is the glory of you to tell us the end from the beginning. Uh, there's, there's no, I don't know of any greater proof of the inspiration of Scripture than the fact that prophecy uh, that has been fulfilled so far has been fulfilled to uh, the maximum, 100% accuracy, in other words, of all prophecy that has been previously fulfilled. It's been fulfilled to the letter. Uh, and, and likewise, we can expect the prophecies that are yet future concerning uh, the Great Tribulation, concerning the return of Christ, concerning these things that are yet to come, we can expect them to be fulfilled to the letter. Lord, you're not, you're not uh, missing anything. You know everything. Uh, Daniel 9 verse 27 tells us that uh, until the consummation of all things, which has been determined. You've already determined the end from the beginning. You already know when the seven years starts. You know when the three and a half years begins. You know who the Antichrist is. You're not adjusting and adapting your plan as we go. The day is already set for the Lord's return. The consummation of the end is already predetermined. And that gives us great comfort to know that you know all things. And of course, it's not beyond you to be able to give us insight into these future things. While we may not know all the details and all the uh, 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 specificity of things, we can see the big picture. And we can see exactly uh, the things that are to transpire toward the end of time. We give you praise. May our hearts be encouraged. May you minister to us throughout this day and remainder of this week. In Jesus' name.